So hi, everybody. Welcome to FDD. I'm Mark Dubowitz. I'm the uh, chief executive here. And uh, we're here um, at a somber time uh, to commemorate the one-year anniversary of the murder of Masa Amini, uh, a 22-year-old Iranian uh, who was brutally murdered by the regime for uh, not having her hijab in place. Um, so it's, it's a, a moment of sadness, but it's also a time to celebrate um, and celebrate the, uh, the Iranian people and particularly the Iranian woman um, who, inspired by Masa Amini, launched a, uh, a campaign for, uh, for women, for, for life, for freedom. And uh, I, I want to take a moment also to, uh, to acknowledge their incredible struggle. Um, as many of you know, the regime brutally cracked down on them. Um, killing over, over 600 Iranians, uh, arresting over 22,000, um, killing, I think, 79, 80 uh, children. There were also uh, attacks against 500 schools um, using chemical weapons. Um, so we at FDD have been tracking this for the year. Um, we also have been acknowledging that uh, these protests haven't stopped, even though the media has stopped covering them. And so we have a, a protest tracker we would encourage you to take a look at every every week to see that Iranians are still on the streets and there are you know dozens if not hundreds of protests every week. Um, I'm very uh, will be very pleased to introduce members of Congress when they arrive. There are votes taking place right now on the Hill um, so we're really pleased that they're going to be able to attend but in the meantime I want to introduce um, my fabulous friend and colleague Ben and Ben Talblu. Uh, Ten years ago he came to us uh, as, a, as a young researcher and uh, has really established himself as, as a leading voice, a renowned expert on Iran. Um, he's both an expert uh, in terms of the depth of his knowledge, and he's gracious and graceful in, uh, in how he uh, handles the issue and, and has situated himself in, in the wa Washington policy ecosystem. So, Bantam, I'd like to welcome you, maybe give some remarks, and uh, take them an opportunity for, for you and I to, to discuss this issue, and then... Uh, We'll include the members of Congress when they arrive. Benham, thanks. Thank you so much, Mark, for that very uh, kind and generous introduction. And thank you to friends, familiar faces, new faces, distinguished members of the think tank audience, Washington audience, press corps, diplomatic corps, and those who are tuning in via live stream. We all have a song a song whose lyrics resonate not just with us, but beyond us. That's what Baraye, or For, in Persian by Shervin Hajipur, became just over one year ago to thousands, if not millions, of Iranian protesters. Triggered by the brutal beating and killing of Masa Jina Amini, a 22-year-old Iranian Kurdish woman for allegedly violating the Islamic Republic's harsh and discriminatory female dress code, protests led by a new and younger generation of Iran's best and brightest and bravest took to the streets. For all the countless fours, sang Hajipur, or more aptly in Persian, Baray in Hame Baray Tekrari. That outpouring of Iranians, mere hours after Massa's hospitalization and death, led to a sustained wave of nationwide protests in 2022 and into 2023 that at its height touched over 150 different cities, towns, and villages across all of Iran's 30 diverse provinces. It also threaded together the widest ever ranging demographic, geographic, and socioeconomic protest movement to date in the 44-year history of the Islamic Republic of Iran. What united so many Iranians were, to borrow from Hajipur, countless fours, or countless predicates for dissatisfaction, discontent, and dissent. But all those fours were rooted in one fundamental and axiomatic recognition that the government of the Islamic Republic in its entirety is to blame. As the many scholars and watchers of and analysts of Iran seated here know, protests against the Islamic Republic have essentially been around as long as there's been an Islamic Republic itself. So why then do protests matter? How can they be novel? And why do they matter more at one point in time than another point in time? The answer can be found in the dynamic and evolving nature of the contest between the state and the street in Iran and the quest for representative government. 
while many in the West are now familiar with the Tehran-centric uprisings about a decade apart in 1999 and 2009 tied to the reform movement, trend lines from the more recent and fast evolving pattern of Iranian protests, particularly since 2017, indicates a move away from reform and towards revolution. Yes, a revolution against the Islamic revolution. Of note, major anti-regime protests are happening more often in Iran, with sometimes just weeks or months separating them, not decades. What's more, they are often happening drawn from the socioeconomic and geographic periphery of the country, and often by classes or generations of people whom the regime thought they could forever co-opt or control. For example, the protests following the killing of Massa in September of last year were not at all the first nationwide anti-regime protests of Iran in 2022. The regime repressed a nationwide uprising only months earlier in May of that year, triggered by a confluence of economic factors that included austerity budgets, pandemic and Ukraine war-induced food and supply chain shocks and shortages, as well as, of course, government mismanagement that would all merge together with the countless other fours simmering constantly beneath the surface in Iran. When piecing together these various rounds of protests, like a mosaic, they represent a larger nationwide struggle that is ongoing against the Islamic Republic. And don't just take it from me. And don't just take it from FDD. Take it from slogans heard across Iran in recent years and what they prove to you about the Iranian people. Gone is anti-Americanism. Our enemies here, they are lying when they say it's America, chant protesters. Gone are previously deemed taboos. Reza Shah, Ruhit Shad, or Reza Shah, bless your soul. Gone are the sacred cows of not insulting the supreme leader. Khamenei qatile velayatish batile, or Khamenei is a murderer, his guardianship is invalid. Gone too is the dissonance between the center and the periphery as Zahedan ta Tehran, janam fadaye Iran, or from Zahedan to Tehran, I sacrifice my life for Iran. Gone too is the pretense of reform, esla talab usul yara, dige tamum majira, or principalist, reformist, the jig is up, is another. Gone seemingly, even in the face of massive repression, is the fear of Iran's security apparatus. Basiji sepai, daesh ma shumai, or Besiji's IRGC, you are our ISIS. As is apparent in these slogans in recent protest history, political protests are not waiting anymore for political events in Iran, like elections, to touch them off. They are happening constantly and are triggered by social, economic, and even environmental issues, resulting in a more frequent boom and bust cycle that Washington cannot afford to get caught flat-footed on and cannot afford to ignore. Here at FTD, we're making sure that does not happen and that the Iranian people's struggle remains part of the strategic discussion and undivorced from the need for things that are urgent, like counterterrorism policy or counterproliferation policy. We will therefore continue to devise new ways and innovative ways for Washington and the international community to hold Iran's repressive apparatus to account, to oppose policies that enrich the oppressors of the Iranian people, and to shine a light on the nexus between Tehran's foreign aggression and Tehran's domestic suppression. This means making sure that every single time the Iranian people protest, Washington is aware. To that effect, during the Massa protests, FTD launched an interactive protest tracker, which Mark mentioned on our website, tallying and documenting every reported protest in Iran of various sizes, of various scales, from across social media, with sourcing, with great detail, as well as with an ongoing data collection effort to tally deaths, including of minors, as well as of arrests of protesting Iranians at the hands of the government of the Islamic Republic. And perhaps on a more personal note, I'm proud to say that as an Iranian-American in my decade with FDD, I have to tell you, I've never seen a day where we work with less vim and vigor to develop complementary policy prongs in support of the Iranian people as we do to devise strategies to pressure the Islamic Republic. Why? Because of all of our own fours and for the fours that we all share. 
for Mahsa Jina Amini, for Hadith Najafi, for Aida Rostami, for Ghazal Chalabi, for Hanan Kia, for Sarina Ismail Zade, for Mona Naqib, for Minu Majidi, for Ferishte Ahmadi, for Nika Shah Karami, for Zan Zendigi Azadi, or for Women, Life, Freedom. And of course, for Muhammad Mehdi Karimi, for Muhammad Hosseini, for Muhammad Rakhshani, for Reza Shah Parinia, for Behnam Layakpur, for Javad Haydari, for Feridun uh, Mahmoudi, for Hamid Reza Ruhi, for Majid Reza Rahnavard, for Kian Firfalak, for Mard Mihan Abadi, for Man Homeland Prosperity. And obviously, to connect the dots and to respect all that came before, for Navid Afkari, for Sattar Beheshti, for Puya Bakhtiari, and who could forget, Neda Agha Sultan. Thank you for your time and attention today. And I'm eager to join Mark on the panel for questions and eager to have the members of Congress uh, come up and grace us with their presence and insights. Thank you all so much. Surprise. Thank you. Hi, Congresswoman. Mark Dubois. Nice to meet you. Claudia. Nice to meet you, Claudia. Tell yeah. me where I'm going. Yeah, right over there would be great. Anywhere here, here, yeah. here. Sit right over there. Right. Let me move my big thing here. Great. Do you want to join us in the meantime? Right, yeah. yeah, please. So, well, thank you. That's so nice to meet you. Congresswoman, thank you so Hope much. Somewhere. I know lots of votes going on on the Hill. <laughs> Not a lot. <laughs> Just untimely. Untimely. <laughs> well, we're, very, we're very grateful that, uh, that you you joined us. Um, I want to just uh, give you a little bit of background on, on FDD, but uh, a simple mission statement, which I, which I think will resonate with you, which is we're a think tank that's about turning ideas into action in defense of American national security. And I think you're, you're a member of Congress who's all about turning ideas into action. Um, and we've seen that in, in all your activity on the Hill. So first of all, thank you for all you do for our country. And, uh, and second, this is uh, obviously a, a somber week where we're commemorating uh, the, the death, the murder of Masa Amini, a 22-year-old Iranian who um, was in Tehran, just you know, in, enjoying the day. Um, her hijab was uh, not um, positioned properly, and she was arrested and, and beaten senseless, and ultimately <coughs> died at the hands of the regime. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, your uh, legislative uh, track record on the Iran issue. Maybe we could start with, um, with the MASA Act. Tell us uh, a little bit about it and, and what you hope to, to achieve with it. Well, thank you, uh, and thank you for having me, and thank you for what you do. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, once I signed on to your, uh, your website, uh, I obviously have a personal interest. A uh, good uh, former chief of staff now joined you, uh, who's a tremendous person, and really kind of bolstered and helped us out with a lot of our Iranian Middle Eastern agenda. But I've always been interested, and uh, not for... Uh, really mostly because of uh, a really good friend of mine who I had, I'd met, who became a client of mine in my old, before politics and everything in my, in my old region, who was, uh, uh, escaped the uh, Khomeini regime, who had worked for the Shah and was hidden in a dairy farm in upstate New York. So I actually learned a lot from him and uh, got to meet so many incredible Iranian people and meeting so many people in the Middle East and getting the opportunity to really understand how critically important this part of the world is to our national security and, and why it's, it's so fragile. So to me, I think we need to be leaders in the United States on this issue. Uh, I followed through on, as a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, of which I'm not on now, but I still maintain my portfolio for foreign affairs. Uh, I'm on Ways and Means and Science, Space, and Technology, uh, but I really have a passion for this part of the world, and I just think right now we are in such a fragile place uh, and we need to advocate strongly, very concerned about a lot of the actions of the administration in terms of not taking advantage of some things we could be doing and, and were started in the, in the last, uh, last administration. And so uh, this whole uh, situation last year with the Masa Amini was just really heart-wrenching for me to see the Iranian people stand up uh, for a young, courageous woman and all these women to stand up and throw their veils aside and stand up against a regime, knowing they're probably going to be killed or jailed or or lose uh, maybe an eye at this point. We know that that's another cruel uh, aspect of what the regime is uh, doing to retaliate against anyone. 
Uh, so we've just taken a strong stand and really taken a deep, deep dive into the, the issues there. I mean, Iran is a huge country with, I think, 90, 87, 88 million people, uh, really situated in a way where they have also a large uh, amount of the oil supply in the world. Uh, so they have energy issues. Uh, they've got China that they're kind of moving closer to. Uh, so I, I just think right now it's such, such an issue, and I think the opportunity to go back with snapback sanctions. I want to say that uh, my colleague, Josh he Gottheimer, who's coming in, co-signed that letter on taking advantage of these snapback sanctions that are before the UN. This, and, you know, we're going to lose some of these ballistic missile uh, opportunities uh, to, cut down, to, to, to fold those back. Uh, in October, and uh, the administration just doesn't seem to want to, they just want to negotiate and get, engage in hostage deals. Uh, I'm really very concerned about this $6 billion hostage exchange, ex especially when you hear from key leaders in Iran that say, good, we're going to take a 1,000 more hostages, and we're going to build back our economy just on using hostage taking. So these are dangerous times, and I think the people of Iran ex expect and want the United States to be the beacon of hope and freedom, and that we will stand up courageously. I just don't, I just don't see why we're not doing that and taking advantage of the moment. But I feel like this tentative foreign policy that we have and sort of the weakness in the administration is part of what's happening. Yeah. I want to ask you specifically about the Mass Act because it, it calls on the administration to impose um, human rights sanctions on, on the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei as well as on uh, the Iranian President Raisi. Um, and it comes at, a, at an interesting time because next week in uh, New York at the UN General Assembly, um, the uh, President Raisi will be speaking, um, and he'll also be speaking at some side events, including at the, at the at Council on Foreign Relations, which has invited him to speak. So we have this prospect of a, a mass murdering uh, Iranian president, not only given an opportunity and a platform to speak okay. at ANGA, again, correct, he spoke there last year, um, but also to speak uh, you know, at, at a, a think tank event. Um, talk a little bit about uh, both the the Mass Act with respect to human rights sanctions, but also you and I believe Senator Cruz introduced another piece of legislation. Um, right, uh, yeah, the, uh, the SEVER Act, Sever Act, which right. prevents uh, the Iranian leader from entering the United States and getting the aid and security of our tax dollars, uh, our security to make sure to keep him safe. We think he should be banned from entering the United States and that's an act I have with uh, Senator Cruz. And uh, we're hoping that, that we can stop this from happening. I, I don't know why the administration is, is giving aid and comfort and security and, a, and, a, and the US platform to someone who has committed just unthinkable atrocities on the Iranian people. I mean, I went to the exhibit yesterday, which uh, we're, we're the Iranian diaspora is holding uh, in the capital. It's in Rayburn, if you want to go see it. I mean, it's got pictures memorializing the people, over 500 protesters murdered by the regime, including Masa. Uh, also, uh, the, the number of young people who've had their eyes shot out, uh, you know, just to make their lives difficult, to, to degrade them. Uh, the grave sites that are being uh, just destroyed uh, of various, uh, various people of, that were killed already by the regime. You know, we're watching on Twitter every time somebody gets arrested or taken over, uh, taken over by the regime. And so I just think it's so important that we, we take a stand on this. I, it's not really a partisan issue. And that I really, I don't know when Josh, when Josh is coming, but uh, he's been a really great partner with us. And, and actually, uh, you know, the act that we, uh, we did, just recognizing the bravery of women and, uh, and people and protesters this year earlier in the House was almost unanimous. I mean, the only vote we didn't get was Tom Massey, but that's a, that's a libertarian specialized vote. He's not, a, he's not against it. It's just his own, you know, his own unique uh, brand of uh, libertarianism. And so anyway, we got a unanimous. So, so again, it's a bipartisan issue. It's very important that we, we do this now. I just think the, um, you know, and I like to imagine a, a, a Middle East where we take away this factor in Iran, the state sponsor of terror, the people that are providing uh, money and resources to some of our enemies, even now in uh, South America and places like that, that we have an opportunity to actually bring pe peace and prosperity to people in the Middle East after following up on the Abraham Accords. I think it's an incredible opportunity, but we're not taking advantage of it, and we're missing steps all along the way. No, that's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, th I think, first of all, uh, the, the notion of Raisi in New York um, is, is horrendous, given what he's done to the Iranian people. But um, I mean, it's worth emphasizing, of course, that also Raisi and his regime are threatening Americans uh, and American officials um, with, with assassination 
Um, you know, we, we take it seriously at FTD because FTD has been sanctioned by Iran. Five individuals at, at FTD have been sanctioned. And of course, when, F, when Iran sanctions you, they don't expect to be seizing your assets at the Central Bank of Iran or, or barring you from uh, travel to Iran. They, this, this is a, they're targeting you. Um, and they're targeting US officials. They're targeting people in the think tank community. They're obviously targeting um, most emphatically Iranian dissidents. And so for, for that reason, um, Congresswoman, I'd, I'd like to just emphasize uh, having Council on Foreign Relations actually give a platform yeah. to a mass murdering uh, dictator who's targeting Americans is something that we, we find beyond the pale. Yeah, very. I, I agree 100%. I will tell you one other thing that I did do because we did have this in our uh, National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, the, IR, the, the administration was supposed to provide us with a report on the activities of the IRGC. Of course, they never did it, so I took it upon myself to actually create our own report using open sources, and among those things are attacking Secretary Pompeo, uh, former uh, uh, National Security Advisor John Bolton. All these people have been targeted. We put our, what we could put together with open source, uh, we, we did, I did my own report since the administration never came out with one in a timely way, so. Thank hey, Josh. Good to see you. Great to How's see you. Everything? Thanks. You got, Sorry a minute late. Apologize. Not, not too much time left, but go ahead. We're no, you, you own it, so go thank ahead. You. No, I'll jump in whenever. Thank you. We've just been complimenting you, so thank jump you. in. Thank you. Just, we just talked about Wow, this is, I missed it? Yeah, sorry. It's all on tape. <laughs> somewhere. All it's all taped. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's got it. Yeah, no, and just say thank you for you with doing the snapback sanctions letter. I guess we're the only ones that have ever done it. I know, it's, great. it's a great thing to work together on. Thank you, yeah. Great, great partner. We, I was just telling him this is a bipartisan issue. I mean, everyone knows that even the, uh, you know, the, our, our act, the bill that we did in, uh, I think it was January, you know, everyone but Massey signed on, and I consider that unanimous. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, Congressman, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having real, me. Real pleasure, and thank you for all the, all the work you do on the Hill. I was saying to, to the Congresswoman, turning, really turning ideas into action. So uh, we're, we're very grateful for that. I know many, many of your amendments have, have been adopted, and I think you're in the top 10 of members of Congress who have amendments being adopted uh, on the floor and elsewhere. If you write thousands enough, it's just percentage. <laughs> <laughs> um, Congressman, let me, let me ask you this. Uh, obviously, the administration is, uh, is negotiating a, uh, an arrangement, a deal, call it what you will, um, giving billions of dollars to the regime um, in exchange for some fairly limited nuclear concessions. Um, I, I, I wanted to note, by the way, that the, I think the notice to Congress for the $6 billion was issued on 9-11, uh, which was sort of a strange day to be sending the leading state sponsor of terrorism $6 billion. Um, talk a little bit about your sort of your perspective on um, on this arrangement, the, the necessity of, of congressional oversight and review, and um, and also just to put in the perspective of, of the week that we're commemorating, which is the uh, the murder of Masa Amini and the launch of of the Iranian protests against this regime. Well, first, thank you for doing it this week. I think it's critically important, both on the 9/11 side, uh, on the anniversary. Um, uh, it's just a uh, and, and thank you for all the FTD's work because I, this issue as uh, Congressman Tenney knows, is so critical to our fight in the United States against terror and against those who seek to do us harm. And when you talk about Iran, as we, you know, I don't know if the Congresswoman talked about this, but, but obviously the legislation we passed earlier this week, all focused on making sure that we hold Iran accountable uh, for their continued nuclear activity and for their continued terror activity. And your organization always has, uh, FCD always has, I should say, um, uh, for a clear reason that it's key to America's national security and our fight, and I think with 9-11 this week, a reminder of our fight globally against terror, against uh, Iran and its proxies, right, and against uh, Hezbollah and Hamas and Palestinian Jihad. And we've seen this activity continue now directly, more directly through IRGC now than ever before, um, right, and in, in Israel more directly on the ground. So um, uh, I look at whatever deal they come, whatever con ultimate conclusion, whenever if, if a deal gets inked and it's finalized and done on their side, I think it's very important. And all these deals have always felt this way, and we've signed letters and on, on this regard that they should come to Congress, and frankly, any president should come to Congress and uh, ask for approval, especially on Iran, where we've been clear, and I've led letters saying that you have to come to us on um, legislation like this. When they were talking about doing JCPOA Part 2 in the beginning of the administration, I led a group of people, uh, uh, including mostly Democrats, because I wanted to send a very clear signal that if you do JCPOA Part 2, you have to come 
to the Congress and actually ask for, uh, uh, th that should be brought for, for us for approval because of, I believe, how, uh, and those of us who opposed the first deal, um, realized how dangerous it could be to support an, uh, a country that is clearly now, and we've seen this in the last year, right, in bed with the Russians and with the Chinese against the Ukrainians on, on, uh, on the drone front, on, uh, on other activity, uh, and on the military side. So I think right now we're at a pivotal moment with Iran. Um, we'll see on this. I, I know some of them on the Intelligence Committee now, so I, I've been fully briefed on this particular thing, so I, I'll, I'll leave other other aspects of this I, I can't talk about, but regardless of what the ultimate agreement is, I think it's got to be brought to us for review, and I think that's very important. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said that, because certainly I think the administration realizes that there's there, there won't be an agreement to sign, um, and they're trying everything they can to, to construct an arrangement to circumvent Congress and your authorities under the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that um, Congress is pushing for oversight because, again, it's going to be the release of not $6 billion, but hundreds of billions of dollars in sanctions relief. Um, and you mentioned China. I wanted to ask both of you about that problem. Um, I think over the past couple years, I think those of us who've been tracking this have noticed that there's been a massive increase in Chinese oil purchases. Um, and uh, reports recently of about a million and a half barrels a, a day of Iranian oil going to China. Uh, which is valued somewhere in the neighborhood of $25, $40, 50000000000 billion, depending on market prices and discounts. Could you both talk about the China-Iran relationship and um, anything that uh, you sort of have in mind with respect to what the administration could and should be doing on China and Iran? Right. Well, I think we alluded to this earlier, uh, that China is moving closer and closer to Iran. They provide something like 90% of their resources, not just energy, but food. It's one of the reasons that was stated, uh, I'll say publicly stated, that uh, the Saudis went to uh, broker some kind of deal between uh, China uh, and Iran uh, because China could actually enact the most leverage against Iran because of the situation there. Uh, at least that was what they stated that was, was the reason. Uh, but China's you know, very important there. I mean, what do you got? Iran is, I think... Uh, over three billion uh, barrels per day they're producing, still in the top 10 oil producers, so a, an important ally for China. China doesn't look at, uh, doesn't look at them as, uh, as you know, ethically and morally like we might look at them. But I think it's a huge problem, and it's why I think we should stop getting into hostage deals, uh, stop, keep, stop talking about the JCPOA and getting back into these deals and really standing up to what the enrichment is, ha is happening on the nuclear side, all these issues. I just think the administration could be bolder, could take on and, and extend some of the good policies that came out of the last administration and build on those. I, I just worry that once uh, you know, we've got China moving that close to Iran, it's going to be almost impossible to separate that, that issue. And, and they're continuing to allow Iran oxygen so they can continue to be a sponsor of terror and now giving them six billion plus hundreds of billions in energy and everything else that's happening, um, you're going to give them even more power. And they're not going to, they're certainly not, I just, I just don't buy that they're going to spend this money, as Blinken indicates, it's going to be monitored and only used for humanitarian aid. Does that mean we're going to deal with, uh, you know, the, the hostages and the, I think, 19,000 people who've been jailed or, and, and put away, you know, for protesting? in the streets. I mean, what are we getting for this? I mean, that, I, I really am concerned about the nature of that. And maybe Josh could. Uh, yeah, I mean, I listen, they're, they're both human rights abusers, right? I mean, to start there. Absolutely. As, right, as, as the, the part of the purpose of us coming together today, right? We, we know that. We know the, the tens of thousands of people have been arrested in the last year in Iran with uh, those who've lost their lives, young people who've lost their lives. Um, and the Chinese have a, a very long record of human rights abuse. So they have that in common. As, as the Congresswoman said, rightly, you know, this is a, uh, uh, a relationship based on mutual need, right, and, uh, and ones that are willing to look past the stuff that we're not willing to look past. And, uh, you know, I, I think given, you know, those of us who have long believed that Iran lies about literally everything, they don't tell the truth about anything, Right, the Iranian government, not the people, the government. 
um, right, and JC, on JCPOA, on the nuclear deals, on their failure to, uh, uh, they still have commitments with Europe that they failed, as we've talked about in the, the efforts we've done together, right? They, on, on their, their terror activity, their claims that they have no control over their proxies over the years, right, their attacks of Americans and our bases and our allies, you can't trust them on anything. So, uh, and so the, anyone who's surprised about the last year on the Iranians with the Russians and the Chinese and getting in bed with them further, like, I, I don't, I was like, how could you even be remotely surprised about that? Right. So my feeling on that is I'm not surprised. Um, I'm, I am only shocked of just how blatant they've been about their activity and, 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 and their weapons support. Uh, so I think it's an alarming issue that we have to pay very close attention to every day. And I worry about the depth of those relationships with the Chinese government because it helps the, China, uh, the Chinese quite a bit um, on the oil front. And um, uh, and puts us in a it puts us in an increasingly tough position. It's why the Abraham Accords and other strategic relationships are so important in the region. And and I think that's been huge progress. And, and I'm glad this administration recognizes the benefits of the Abraham Accords. That's been a good thing. And trying to deepen them and extend them, um, that's good. Uh, Builds on the last administration's success on that front. And I think it's a huge success. So. I, you know, I, I believe those, for, for, from a regional perspective and from a global perspective, those are the kind of efforts we should be putting more energy into. Well, I, I know well, I got a note that you both have to leave, but I wanted to uh, first thank you for coming. But I also wanted to thank you. Um, I feel badly that I made the congresswoman carry through all the war. Through all the well, I, I, sorry. Well, I'll note she did a great job. So yeah, um, thank you so much. Thank you. But also ev you. everything you've done, um, I think, to both put maximum pressure on the regime, but also to provide maximum support to the Iranian people. I mean, I think at FDD, we, we believe in twinning maximum pressure with maximum support uh, as a sound US policy. And even though I think the administration is sort of back down on maximum pressure, I think we should all get behind on a bipartisan basis, maximum support for you know, the 80 plus million Iranians who at the end of the day, um, one life, one freedom, one prosperity. So thank you to you both for Which is why you're that. right that we actually have to completely tighten sanctions and continue tightening sanctions and, and make sure they snap back. I think if, they, if the administration would support our snapback sanctions request, I think that would be a huge step forward in helping. I, I, look, we we're running out of time, but maybe we can go pressure. together and do that. I'm happy to do it. <laughs> I think, go. But I think that's the key. We yeah, that, have, that's critical. We have to keep up the pressure because uh, otherwise, if we, if we, you know, and I think that was working, the pressure, and that's why you got to be very careful on how much you ease that pressure. No, that's exactly right. So um, again, th I would love to actually spend all afternoon talking to you. And I, I don't know if, uh, if you, I think your staff. Did nope. <laughs> I see. I see one of your did staff. Did they actually call saying, votes? I don't yeah, know. Yeah. How much time do we have? I think they we called votes. So uh, did they? I'll, uh, yeah. I'll thank you again. I certainly invite you back because we'd we'd love to talk more about snapback. We'd love to talk more about um, congressional oversight of the nuclear deal. And I think we'd love to to talk to you about again a maximum support campaign. A, a legislative strategy, because I think... Um, to help the Iranian people. To help the Iranian yeah, people. Yeah, I think, I think it's we, critically important. You know, I think the United States missed a huge opportunity during these protests um, to provide um, what the Iranian people really needed uh, on, on a whole host of issues and this, this really practical, action. If you had a magic wand, what would you do today? W what would I do today with respect to uh, the protests? Yeah. Ah, I think, you know, ma magic wand would be to... Um, provide the Iranian people with, with everything they need to evade the security forces, right? So there are technologies that we can get in their hands. Um, we have capabilities in the United States uh, and through our allies particularly um, to help identify members of the security forces, name who they are, show their faces, um, provide technologies to, to blind the security forces. I mean, you could imagine but, you had know, there been like a cyber uh, but, initiative. But one of the things that we did, uh, Josh and I did together on our act that in, in January was we actually, not only uh, do we support the Iranian people, we also urged uh, Elon Musk to provide Starlink so we could get notifications so the world would know what was happening. We did a lot of, I mean, we were pushing on every angle we could to give them the notoriety, the recognition. We've pushed on Parliament, uh, who, who, and you know, the European Union, of course, did not pick up uh, on our, our request, but at least we got IRGC designated as a foreign terrorist organization. Mm -hmm. 
uh, by, by the U.S. Uh, the Parliament recognized it. They didn't finalize it. We need the European Union to come follow. We, we've done, we've, we've, we're pressuring in every way we can to give the notoriety to people so people know they're suffering, that they know that, uh, you know, between the, the regime is shooting out the eyes of healthy young people, you know, in a, in a disgusting, right. you know, act against them. And we, we just, we've done, a, we've put a lot of pressure. We just need the administration, I think. And I think I would love to, like, see if we can do some more work on getting more members on both sides to really uh, come together. Yeah. On that. One, one thing on my wish list would be, and, and Ronald Reagan did this during the Cold War uh, with solidarity in Poland, mm -hmm. but set up some kind of strike fund for Iranians who are going on strike yeah. uh, and, and encouraging them to stay on strike. Obviously, there are no unions in, in Iran. Right. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be uh, getting union support at all um, when they go on strike. It's, they're not going to have the money to feed their families. But I think what the Reagan administration understood is you can I'm, do a I'm lot. I'm sure they're afraid them. because they've gotten the death penalty. People get the death penalty for speaking out. Right, I mean, it's, right. Uh, and the fear that's, uh, that they've imposed on the people there. Uh, right, but at least provide them with a strike fund. So yeah. it, when they're going on strike and yeah. they're, in the, they're out there on the streets facing down the brutality of these security forces, um, there's a way to actually um, provide them with uh, the support they need to feed their families. You might have you know, more than 100, 200,000 Iranians on the street as a result. You, you may have millions, and, right. and that's ultimately going to be the decisive moment. I know you've got to go, but the good news is this is bipartisan. So I think that's we've got to keep growing the bipartisan support for this. Because regardless of administration uh, or Congress or the Senate, whoever in charge, this has to be something that we're focused on as a country. So Absolutely. I agree. want to thank, thank the you. Congresswoman for doing this. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take audience questions with uh, Mark Dubowitz and uh, Behnam in a moment once the representatives leave. So if you just sit tight, you'll have all the time in the world. Okay, I think we'll, we'll continue uh, the discussion. Um, and I think what we want to do is we, uh, this is sort of a, a great uh, segue into like drilling into, you know, what can be done from an action perspective? What does maximum support look like for the Iranian people? Um, so certainly, whatever's on your mind in, in terms of Q&A, we've got well, one of Washington's top Iran experts here um, to, to analyze the situation, but also to talk about, again, what does maximum support look like and what can be done. And we have a, a wealth of expertise in, in the room, too, uh, covering many sides of the political spectrum. So you know, consider it maybe a two-way street. Uh, on some of the issues particularly that are coming up, whatever your lane or, or, or vector of interest, human rights and, and the other uh, you know, great power strategic competition, because all of this stuff, I think, as both member of Congress has uh, alluded to, is quite interconnected. The, the domestic repression, the foreign aggression is connected. Uh, the great power patronage is connected. Uh, there are literally Chinese tech firms that are subject to US sanctions today that are doing the opposite of what Marx said, which is helping the regime, not helping the people, helping the regime identify through facial recognition software and cameras on streets who is protesting, where are they protesting, where are they going back to, creating uh, a literal database of addresses, faces, and then helping the security force merge them with names uh, to be able to empower Iran's apparatus of repression. So there is breadth and depth there to discuss, but I think it was a pretty, pretty helpful discussion by both sides of the aisle here. Uh, this morning I was testifying before the Hill. Again, a lot of bipartisan consensus on the need to do this, and a lot of shared consensus. I see many friends uh, in the audience now. NUFTI, National Union for Democracy in Iran, also stands very strongly uh, in favor uh, of maximum support, amplifying many of their own policy recommendations in this space as well. There is much more that unites us uh, one year after Massa that divides us. So I think that, that we definitely have in our favor. Yeah. So if, as you're thinking of questions, by the way, one of the things uh, I, I kind of want to go to you is I, I want to just give a huge shout out to the Iranian American community. 
uh, particularly on the incredible uh, work and advocacy and education that they did on the, on the Mass Act. I mean, it's somebody who's been working in this town for 20 years uh, and has seen other organizations um, who claim to represent the Iranian American community uh, consistently on the wrong side of the issue. It, it was a real, um, a real pleasure uh, to see the Iranian American community mobilize and uh, in support of, of Massa's memory and, um, and in support of real legislation that I think has, has some real teeth. So a uh, huge shout out to, to the Iranian American community. Icon. Icon Erdemir ADL. Uh, thank you, Mark, for, and FTD for honoring Massa's legacy today. And thank you, Behnam, for your really moving speech. I have a question about uh, transatlantic action. You know, lately we have been witnessing some momentum in the UK concerning the designation of the IRGC. Uh, we have seen similar momentum within the European Union, but ultimately we don't see that final step. So what role uh, can the United States play or what leverage does the United States play in getting transatlantic allies to take that final step. I, I know it won't be the final, but that important step, uh, which would begin with the designation of the IRGC. I think it's, it's a very critical question. We have quite literally members of uh, European embassies uh, in the room, distinguished lawyers who are working on this issue uh, as well, quite literally finding every single angle to begin with. But the lack of an IRGC terror designation or lack of an IRGC terror prescription by our friends across uh, the pond, if you will, in the UK and in the EU space is a symptom of a broader problem. And step one in that broader problem is there has been a, a mistrust in the goals. To what purpose are these sanctions supposed to be levied? We saw, for instance, the European Union, the European community, not trust in 2020, for example, August, September 2020 not trust the Trump administration's effort to try to restore an international arms embargo was sincere. September or August 2020. September 2022 is also the one year anniversary of the widest ever Iranian drone proliferation outside of the Middle East. Quite literally, Iranian drones, in spite of that broken arms embargo, are now being used against European citizens. So step number one has to be no more own goals. No more spiting this side of the Atlantic or that side of the Atlantic because you disagree with that politician or disagree with that view. Uh, I think letting that embargo slide is an own goal and letting the one that's coming up in October 2023, the October 18th transition day ones, letting that slide would be an own goal. There is some good news coming out of Europe based on reports earlier this summer the European Union and potentially the UK look like they're about to defend their own sovereign non-proliferation sanctions architecture. If they did this, this would be the mother of own goals. If they didn't, I'm sorry, if they didn't do this, they would be delisting over 300 Iranian missile military nuclear entities, an example of which is actually the IRGC. Few people know this. During the campaign since the killing of Massa, where the Iranian community, particularly the Iranian diaspora in the UK, and then the EU were super active to get parliaments in those jurisdictions to put pressure on their foreign ministries to designate the IRGC. There is only one European authority where the IRGC in its entirety is designated. And it's not human rights. And it's not cyber. It's non-proliferation. And if the European Union does not defend this sanctions architecture by October 18, and fortunately some of the news this summer is that they might do that, still a might, that the IRGC, let me say this clearly, the IRGC would be sanctions free in Europe, meaning that the IRGC would not be on a single sanctions list in its entirety. You could have the Quds Force on something, you could have elements of Iran's Ministry of Intelligence and Security, which, uh, elements of which the uh, European Council designated in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, but as a whole, that would be a major setback to that goal of trying to get a terrorism prescription because the only authority under which the IRGC was designated in its entirety would actually have been revoked. So while we need to build on the many successes of the Iranian diaspora and every community that is lobbying to get terror sanctions on the IRGC, not just in Europe, but also in Canada and Australia and New Zealand, where many communities have mobilized to use similar authorities against the same target, and again, a web of interconnected sanctions on the same target would send a strong economic message, it would send a super strong political message, and it would tell the Islamic Republic that it can no longer play one side of the Atlantic or one side of the world uh, against each other because it would be a no-go zone. Every jurisdiction would be a no-go zone 
uh, for Iran. So step number one is recognizing where the holes are, plugging them, and doing no harm. Yeah, I would just add to that. If, if you really want to uh, read a fabulous book, it's actually one of my, I think, one of my favorite books, not, not just on Iran, but in general, is Roy Akakian's The Assassins of the Turquoise Palace. And, and how many of you have read, have read the book? Good, I'm, I'm doing a book, a book plug here for Roy. Um, it's, it's a terrific story about when Europe actually uh, was at its finest in pushing back against uh, regime assassinations on the continent. It tells the story of um, a brave um, German prosecutor who went after the assassins who killed uh, Iranian Kurds in Germany um, and relentlessly um, pushed through you know, bureaucracy and, and political resistance to hold these uh, regime officials and, and operatives accountable for this assassination on German soil. It led to a big trial in Germany where all of this came out. And it led for uh, a period of time where uh, Iranian, quote, diplomats, um, essentially intel, intel officials from Mois and IRGC, were expelled from European soil. It's a great story. Um, and so my addition to Benham's great policy recommendations is recreate assassins of the turquoise palace in terms of European response to uh, Iranian threats to, to European citizens. I mean, they're, re they're holding them hostage. Uh, they're attempting to kill them. And the European response so far has been, I would say, nothing short of feckless. But there was a moment in European history where the Europeans came together and showed tremendous courage. So read the book, fantastic book, and, uh, and then adopt the policy recommendations for our, our, our European friends. Um, Holly Digress, Atlantic Council. Mark, um, FTD is not the first to float a strike fund. Um, it's a great idea in theory, especially with the diaspora's net worth believed to be 2.5 trillion. But I'd like to know how that can be executed. Great. Hi, Holly. Nice to see you. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously operationally, it, 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 it's a tricky thing. I mean, the question is, how do you move money into Iran? How do you get that money in the right hands? Um, and you know, my, my assumption is my, money can be moved. Um, there's certain, numerous examples, some reported, some not reported, of um, both funds and, uh, and materials being moved into Iran through, through various networks, um, American and, and allied networks. Um, how do you get that money into trusted sources? I think that's obviously going to be uh, an, a tricky in intelligence. Um, operation, but I think there are enough uh, trusted sources inside Iran that the Iranian diaspora knows and that the U.S. government and allied governments know. Um, but I think our assumption has got to be, you know, a certain percentage of that money is just going to be stolen. It's going to end up in the wrong hands. Um, but, we, if, but a certain percentage of that money can get to the right people, can get to union organizers, can get to people who can then distribute that money um, within different sectors of the Iranian economy. And again, I don't think it's just one person gets all the money and distributes it. This is within the trucking sector. This is within you know, the education sector, within the energy sector. It's pinpointing people who are trusted and then have their own networks within those industries to get that money out uh, in, uh, to the right people. And it's basically you know, what union organizers do all over the world, but it's obviously going to be done under much dangerous conditions. Um, but I, I would just conclude with this. If we think that we can implement a strike fund and, and ensure that not one dollar ends up in the wrong hands, we will be paralyzed and we'll never do it. We're going to take, we're going to take some risk. We're going to understand that some of that money is going to end up in, in the wrong hands. Um, but in the meantime, the, the, I think the benefits outweigh the costs. Iranians who go to the streets are not only today risking their lives, but their livelihood. And at, at the very least, we can help them with, uh, with supporting their livelihood as they take to the streets. Yeah, I think if I may just put a brief footnote on that, a very wise woman also named Holly Dagris uh, said about a year or so ago into the Massa, when the Massa protests were breaking, uh, that the Iranian people deserve our support and not our skepticism. I, I agreed with her then, and I agree with her very much now. Uh, in essence, there's two role models here. One, of course, is the one Mark talked about with Solidarity in Poland. And then the other one is the flooding of the supply side. And I see members of the audience that we've engaged with on Starlink when we've talked about how to flood the supply side. 
Uh, and the parallel here is, again, in the telecom and satellite world. You know, in the 90s and 2000s, uh, for instance, there was tons of black market satellites emerging in Iran. Uh, satellites that were confiscated, satellites that were smuggled in, satellites that people paid a premium for, satellites that were confiscated and then resold to you at that premium by elements of the Guard Corps or the Basij, such that even though in a regulatory perspective inside Iran, uh, there were prohibitions to getting these satellites and engaging in transactions for these satellites, the flood from the supply side, the cheap available flood from the supply side made it impossible for the regime to sustain this prohibitive policy and had to adapt with it over time. So in essence, you want to make sure the regime knows that the tap for any kind of foreign uh, strike fund is never going to be turned off. And one way you can ensure this is through aggressive enforcement of oral sanctions. Me and a colleague, Saeed Ghassam Nijad, have written about this extensively. There is not much that unites Trump and Biden, but one thing does. Their enforcement and seizure of select oil tankers. And in fact, both states using commerce and justice to do asset forfeiture. You see the story of the Suez Rajan just a week ago in the news. This is good news. This money, I know there's many different lawsuits about different Iranian assets abroad, but it would be in the U.S. national interest, and I think the Iranian population is lucky that there's a confluence of moral and strategic interest here, for every penny, every real, however you want to denominate it, of Iranian assets from X point on seized goes to that strike fund. So you build in the fact that some of it is going to go to waste, fraud, and abuse. You build in the fact that you need new technical, legal, political, and regulatory mechanisms to essentially smuggle this money in. You have an IC cover for that. And then ultimately, you make sure there's not a penny of taxpayer money that goes to waste, fraud, and abuse because this is confiscated oil assets anyway. So someone like Raisi doesn't dare say that oil money belongs to the nation when we know how Raisi likes to spend Iran's oil money. Yeah. We can spend that oil money in a much better way. I think it's, I think it's a good point. I also would add that, I mean, the real dollar exchange rate is, what, 500,000 now? Reals to the U.S. dollar? So if you thought about a strike fund and what it would actually take to run a strike fund, and, and obviously the way you'd run it is you, you, know, you would pilot it first before you rolled it out uh, across industries or, or nationally. But at that real dollar exchange rate, um, from a U.S. perspective, it would, would not be prohibitively expensive uh, to fund that, give, given how many reals today you, you, you get for a U.S. dollar. So like, let, let's try it. I mean, at, what's going to happen at worst? All of the money ends up in a pilot in the wrong hands. OK. So we've wasted a few hundred thousand dollars. Um, but what, what could happen is we start to realize, and obviously this is an iterative process as we learn about how to do this, that we could get you know, large sums of reals in, in Iranian hands uh, at fairly low expense in US dollars. Uh, and it really could be a game changer in, ter in terms of broad strikes through uh, labor strikes through these these industries that, that could cripple the regime. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mark Rod with Jewish Insider. Um, there was actually an announcement um, on the subject of the first question within the last hour or two that the E3 are planning on keeping their sanctions but are not going to be seeking snapback. And so I guess I'm just wondering what the, the logic of that could be, of saying we think these are sanctions that are important to keep in place, but we're not even going to try and get the UN to keep them. And then just sort of a quick secondary question for Benham. You just uh, testified on the Hill this morning. Any insights at this point coming off of that um, of you know what the, the chances for bipartisan action on this are at this point? Yeah. Look, on the first question, I mean, um, it, it really th depends on your theory of the case. Right? If, if you think that showing resolve um, and, in, and putting pressure on the regime will cause the regime to escalate, then you, that you won't do snapback because you are worried that snapback sanctions will lead to increased regime nuclear escalation. If you believe, on the other hand, that by showing resolve, and again, transatlantic resolve to the question on, on the Europeans, um, is going to cause the, the regime to, to pause or to back down, right, then snapback sanctions make uh, eminent sense. Now, I think this is a, just a perennial debate in Washington. I mean, what, what is your theory of the case? My theory of the case, and I, I think there's a lot of historical examples, we can go through that if we, if we have time, is when you show resolve to the regime, particularly transatlantic resolve. Um, and that certainly was the, the case that made by the Obama administration uh, back, in, uh, back in the day. 
is that transatlantic resolve would be much more effective in getting the regime to back down. Um, and I, I, think, I think they were right. And that's why the sanctions leading up to the JCPOA were highly effective, because they were transatlantic sanctions, in some cases UN sanctions, global sanctions, um, that sent a message to the regime that there would be an international price to be paid if they continue to escalate. I would add, too, and again, a subject of much debate, um, most of Iran's nuclear escalation occurred with the election of Joe Biden and his decision to abandon pressure and, and engage in diplomacy. I mean, we, we put at FDD uh, out a graphic regularly. I tweet it out probably once a month uh, to demonstrate the nuclear timeline and the political timeline. Uh, Benham and our colleague Andrea Stricker put this together, and it shows very, very clearly that the regime was not willing to escalate in the face of maximum pressure. When they started to escalate their nuclear program, was right at the election of, of President Biden and his decision to abandon pressure. So snapback sanctions, in my view, will not lead to regime escalation. It'll be a, a demonstration of transatlantic resolve. And it, it's the best chance we have of, of getting the regime to understand that there is a significant price to be paid for, for continued escalatory activities. Yeah, just a, a couple of very quick footnotes. Again, it's a very commendable posture by the European Union and the United Kingdom if they defend those 300 plus names of missile military nuclear entities. But that's not like scoring a goal on the Islamic Republic. That's like preventing an own goal. Because you had signed up to remove these missile military nuclear entities in 2015 with the JCPOA anyway. So, you know, th there's no gold stars for participation in defending yourself. You're supposed to be doing that as a sovereign political entity on a daily basis anyway. But in this political climate, obviously, the reason it's important is it would mark the European Union's first ever intentional violation of the JCPOA. And that is where proponents of pressure can take a little bit of solace in the move. We have fundamentally different theories of the case, for example. We see Europe's lack of going to snap back is still some kind of commitment to the JCPOA. Their fear of escalation, Mark was talking about, that animates it totally. But this would be big because this is Europe's first ever JCPOA violation. And Iran is likely going to respond. And the question is going to be not to Europe, but to the Biden administration. Now will you have your transatlantic partners back when Iran tries to threaten Europe? Two years ago, the Europeans laughed at the Americans for trying to prevent an arms embargo from lapsing. Then two years later, the Europeans themselves became subject to a widening radius of Iranian arms proliferation. We can't afford to make that same mistake on missile. On the Hill today, there was great interest in snapback, but again, that is where, because of the politics of the JCPOA, is one of the few areas of disunity in the hearing I heard. I think on everything else, standing with the Iranian people, being tough on oil sanctions, uh, being tough on, on non-proliferation, missile military stuff, uh, countering the Iran-Russia-China nexus, there was great bipartisan support. Uh, and there is a page that can be taken from the way the U.S. Congress is dealing with the China issue to I inform and animate how they're going to deal with the Iran issue. Hopefully that's where the trend lines go. Um, but the politics of the moment, the JCPOA, plus the philosophy and theory of the case, that continues to operate uh, like the 800-pound elephant in the room. Yeah, and then I just want to expand the scope of this because um, right now there's a big debate about giving the Saudis domestic enrichment, and FDD has been very firm, I think in one voice, um, that we oppose giving Saudi Arabia domestic enrichment. Right? We think this has significant proliferation consequences. We warned back in 2015 that giving, a, giving the regime in Iran domestic enrichment would lead to exactly the moment we are in with the Saudis right now. And, and I fear the administration and the Israelis are, are going to cave on this question. Uh, and there'll be some, you know, lovely formula construct about how it'll be under American control and supervision and what, what have you. I think all of that is nonsense. Because I think at the end of the day, um, as soon as there's domestic enrichment in Saudi Arabia, you can just mark your calendar. And at some point, the Saudis will be a threshold nuclear weapons power with their ability to project, pr produce fissile material. To snap back, this is it. You snap back the UN sanctions. You reestablish zero enrichment as the international standard. And you say, we will not allow it for Iran, and we will not allow it for Saudi Arabia, and we will not allow it for the Emiratis, or, or the Turks, or the Algerians, or the South Koreans, or whoever comes next. So for that reason, snap back is not just about pressuring Iran. It's also about sending a message to Saudi Arabia and to uh, our allies and adversaries around the world. The United States does not support domestic enrichment or plutonium reprocessing, and we don't endorse uh, proliferation. I see a wrap-up and this symbol, so uh, 
want to thank everybody for, for coming and look forward to chatting with you after the event. And uh, I really just want to take this moment uh, to say uh, you know, a silent prayer for the Iranian people uh, and in memory of, of Masa Amini uh, for everything that uh, they are doing to, to stand up for, for women, for, for life, for freedom. And uh, let's hope, uh, as we say, next year in Tehran in a free, uh, democratic, and peaceful Tehran. Thanks, everybody.